Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. My name is uh, Emily Sartoretto, and I'm the Interim Communications Manager at the Canadian Public Health Association. So we'll get started. I just want to make sure that everyone can hear me clearly. So if you're having trouble, there's a chat box in the bottom right hand corner. So if you can let me know, we'll be moderating that throughout just in case so you can hear us uh, clearly. So before we get on to our main event with Dr. Padi, we'll, um, we'll, I'll touch briefly on the, pub the Canadian Public Health Association and, and what it does. Also, you can hear me clearly, that's great, thank you. So at the association, one of the key areas of our work is to advocate for public health, speaking up for people and populations to all levels of government. We champion health equity and social justice and evidence-informed decision-making. We leverage knowledge, identify and address emerging public health issues and connect diverse communities of practice. Right now, you may have seen, if you follow us on Twitter or Facebook, we've been involved in the conversation around decriminalizing drugs for personal use, but we've also advocated for other um, public health changes at the policy level. Uh, we've put out policy positions on um, Jordan's principle and the public health approach to cannabis. So in everything we do, we try and promote the public health perspective and ev evidence to government uh, leaders and policymakers so they can make informed choices. We, are, we act as a catalyst for change that improves health and well-being for all. And our vision is a healthy, just world. Our mission is to enhance the health of people in Canada and to contribute to a healthier and more equitable world. Our strategic plan, uh, which launched in 2016, will also give you a bit of an idea of who we are and what we hope to achieve by 2020. So uh, the CPHA would be the national independent evidence-based voice for public health in Canada. We represent the public health community's interest in public system renewal. We act as a convener of partners to identify solutions to public health issues. We have an engaged and dynamic membership, which we definitely have right now. We are financially and organizationally resilient and sustainable. And lastly, that we inspire and motivate change in support of health equity. Today's session, we are co-hosting with the Public Health Physicians of Canada. So big thanks to them for putting us in touch with uh, Dr. Potty and help it, helping us coordinate today's webinar. For those of you who may not know this organization, their mission is to establish and promote Canadian public health and preventative me medicine specialists as recognized and respected leaders in health protection, in health promotion, and in preventing disease and injury. This webinar is part of a larger monthly series that we have, and we hope you can join us for future sessions. If you stay tuned until the end, I'll share the link so that you can register to the next session in January. And that topic uh, in January will be health promotion. So before we get started, um, this is the, the schedule. So you have an idea of what's coming up. We might also have a session in April on public health nursing. So stay tuned for that too. And in terms of housekeeping, you've probably noticed by now that you're all muted. So we do hope to engage you throughout the webinar through the chat box. So if you have any questions that you think of as the presenter is presenting, please feel free to, to uh, post them right away. I'll be collecting them and then gathering them to ask at the end during the Q&A portion. And if you are on Twitter, feel free to, to tweet using our hashtag that I've just posted in the, in the chat box. So we encourage you to make your questions and comments visible to everyone. We'll attempt to answer them all, and if we run out of time, we'll answer them by email. We'll also be sharing the webinar recording today after the webinar. So as a reminder, I'll just post this here. So please do send your questions in the chat box. And one last thing before I introduce today's speaker. We have um, early bird re registration for our annual conference that will open in February. And we've, re we've received 
a record number of submissions this year for the conference that just closed last week. So we can expect a high caliber of presenters. So I urge you, if you're interested in attending, that you sign up to the newsletter. We anticipate that registration um, will be just as popular as our call. So if you don't want to miss out, do subscribe to our newsletter so you can be prompted as soon as those early bird um, registration links are up. And um, also a heads up that we'll be launching a call for submission to present at two events that are concurrent with our annual conference. One of them is focused on tobacco and one of them on, immu on immunization. So if you want to receive those, you can also sign up to our conference email um, newsletter and you'll receive that as soon as it's uh, available. So now on to the main event. Today's speaker is Dr. Shovita Padi. She is a medical health officer with Fraser Health and a clinical assistant professor in the School of Public Health, and um, pardon me, the School of Population and Public Health at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia. Her, pro her primary area of work includes um, child early childhood development and immunization with a key focus on reduce reducing health inequity, inequities and um, in these areas. So without further, further ado, Dr. Padi, I turn the mic over to you. Great, thanks Emily. Uh, I'll just do a quick sound check right now. If someone can just give me a thumbs up uh, through the chat box. All right, thanks Laura. Um, so for the purpose of today's uh, a discussion, you know, I don't want to take up too much of the time uh, speaking because I really want to be here to um, answer all your questions and uh, hopefully provide a bit of guidance uh, for those of you who are going through your uh, careers right now. Um, before we begin, I was wondering if we could just do a quick poll, and um, Emily, hopefully everyone can see this poll. And uh, just click on um, one of the circles which applies to you the most. Let's give it a few seconds here. This will help me tailor uh, the talk so I can be as uh, applicable uh, to you all. Okay. Oh, still a few more people. Okay, so it looks like we have um, a diverse group here. So uh, some of you are currently um, in your MPH or um, have completed your MPH. Uh, there's uh, graduate students in other disciplines um, or who have completed uh, their master's degree from other disciplines. Uh, there's a medical student and a resident. And I do recognize a few of those who have completed residency and. Um, if, if, uh, for those of you who are currently practicing as medical health officers, if you'd like to also um, chime in via the chat box, that would be great as well. Great. Oh, and we have a physician doing an MPH. Excellent. Okay, so um, for today's presentation, uh, because we have such a diverse group, I will go into a bit of information on how to become a medical health officer. Um, and then uh, a bit more into the roles and responsibilities and sort of what um, our day-to-day -day activities entail. So uh, first and foremost, I think we need to talk about um, actually um, the title, the job title. Uh, many of you uh, might not be familiar with it uh, because uh, in the eastern part of the country, um, and in other jurisdictions in the world, uh, we are known as medical officers of health. Um, and uh, it's the same uh, job, essentially. So it just depends on what jurisdiction you're in, uh, whether you're referred to as a medical health officer or a medical officer of health. So I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, in order to become a medical health officer, I would say in this day and age now, uh, um, is sort of as follows. So in, in Canada, the typical trajectory would be you complete an undergraduate degree um, in whatever discipline, um, provided it can, it can uh, give you the prerequisites to get into a medical school. 
then you complete your three to four years of medical school training. Uh, and then you apply for a residency position in public health and preventive medicine. Uh, this is a known as a Royal College uh, specialty. It's five years. Usually your first, uh, first or second years constitute of doing a clinical uh, year or two. Uh, sometimes uh, many of my colleagues are dual certified as family physicians and as uh, Royal College trained physicians. Then uh, if you haven't completed a master's degree prior to uh, entering either medicine or uh, entering residency, you usually complete a master's degree. And the most common route now is in um, an MPH, so master's in public health. Uh, many uh, MHOs are trained as epidemiologists. Uh, so myself, um, I did my MPH at the University of Toronto in the community health and epidemiology stream. Um, and then from there, you focus your sort of your last three to five years on doing core public health rotations. And um, different residency programs will have different names and durations for their rotations. But um, we are guided, uh, um, I guess now it's through the CANMEDS uh, roles for public health and preventive medicine physicians. Uh, what type of skills you need to develop and acquire during your training. Uh, so core rotations would include communicable disease, environmental health, some form of chronic disease and health policy rotation, uh, possibly a senior management rotation. And then embedded within these rotations, you would uh, be applying your, your surveillance and epidemiological skills, your policy writing, um, you know, um, doing community engagement, interacting with various stakeholders, um, um, and learning sort of uh, the arts of management, leadership, negotiation, and diplomacy. And, and I'll touch a bit more upon that when I go through the roles and responsibilities. Now, unlike many other Royal College uh, specialties, for instance, you know, you go through training uh, to become an orthopedic surgeon, you come out as an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, likewise, you, you do your training to become a cardiologist, adult cardiologist. You become an adult cardiologist, you know, with a, a few areas of specialty. Uh, the beauty I find with public health and preventive medicine training is your only your career option isn't only uh, just the medical health officer route. It actually uh, can become choose your own career. Essentially, uh, the world is your oyster, and you can choose um, many different paths. So, I'll just list off a few common um, types of uh, careers for public health physicians, and, and it's important to note that. Uh, you can actually have several of these types of careers as in one individual. Uh, so the typical ones are the medical health officer uh, at the local, provincial, provincial, or even at the federal level. Uh, you can also become a public health physician at uh, what I deem sort of the knowledge institutes in this country. So um, knowledge slash, you know, provincial agencies, so Public Health Ontario, BC, CDC, uh, INSPQ in, in Quebec, uh, where you can do more of the um, uh, research and, um, and uh, support uh, medical health officers in the work that they do. There's also completely academic route, uh, so um, being a tenured uh, professor at a school of public health. Uh, we've had colleagues go on to be politicians. The current health minister in Ontario, Eric Hoskins, is um, a PHPM uh, grad. Um, we also have uh, people uh, start up their own NGOs. Um, uh, Samantha Nutt started War Child. Um, some go on to become TV, TV personalities, so Carl Cavassell and Marla Shapiro. Um, so I hope that's giving you a flavor of the possibilities of when you do this training, um, which avenues you can, you can go down. Um, so 
I'll go and uh, speak to um, the roles and responsibilities now of a, a medical health officer. And um, what I want to state is it's, I think it's the best job in the world. Um, it's great for people who get bored easily because, you know, I've been at this, including, you know, via my medical school training. I started my first public health rotation in the fall of 2007. And that was, yeah, about 10 years ago. And I have yet to have the same day repeat itself. Uh, so that's fantastic if you get bored really easily. Um, so I would highly recommend uh, this field and in this position. So going into the roles and responsibilities. Um, so there's some core functions that at the local public health. And I'm going to speak from the local public health context because that's um, what I know. Um, the job and roles are slightly different if you're um, the chief medical officer of health for a province um, or even at the federal level. So uh, health surveillance uh, is really important. We need to know uh, what the health status of our population is, what the problems are, uh, what are contributing to health inequities um, and, and the root causes. Uh, that really drives uh, or should drive our work. Um, I will add um, a point here that public health is also a very political uh, field, uh, believe it or not. It's probably the most political in all of medicine. And um, so sometimes, you know, um, there's other agendas that might drive our work. But if we want to be a purist, you really want to be data driven. And this is where it's really helpful having those skills as an epidemiologist, but also having um, your, your team uh, 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 who work with you at the local uh, level. Uh, uh, many of us are blessed to have epidemiologists, biostatisticians, uh, data analysts, uh, GIS mappers, visual anal um, analytics specialists, uh, program evaluators. Uh, who help us uh, get an understanding of our community. And um, so when we, when we identify key priority areas uh, in our communities, uh, that then drives our work. Another role is uh, we act as a community health consultant and um, you know, especially with respect to communicable disease control and prevention. Uh, so when it comes to um, assessing, um, you know, the spread of communicable diseases in our community and, and looking at potentials for outbreaks or even dealing with outbreaks, uh, the MHO uh, tends to get involved uh, with those uh, scenarios. Um, ideally, um, if we have good surveillance data, um, we'd like to prevent these before they happen. So, for example, looking at our immunization coverage rates and, and making sure that our population is well protected uh, so that we don't, you know, get those measles outbreaks or those outbreaks of mumps. But as you've probably seen in the media, we do still get those. And uh, we work with our team of uh, public health nurses and public health inspectors in BC. They're known as EHOs, environmental health officers, um, as well as our community partners, infection um, prevention and control at our acute care centers and long-term care facilities. Uh, we all work together uh, to stem uh, the spread of uh, these communicable diseases. We are an administrator of the public health legislation. So every jurisdiction in this country has a, a public health act of some form or another. Um, and in that act, it, it lists out um, a lot of, uh, you know, points of, um, uh, you know, where the medical health officer and where public health would get involved in ensuring um, that the health of the population is protected. In order to, uh, to enact the public health legislation, uh, so for instance, um, 
being able to apply public health orders. So I'll just pause here and explain what an order is. Um, an order um, is essentially similar to other physician orders, but you're ordering um, uh, external people in the community, whether it's uh, businesses or potentially municipal governments or individuals, uh, to stop and cease uh, their practice as it's contributing to a health hazard. Um, likewise, for individuals, if we know an individual um, is, is knowingly spreading uh, chemical diseases, uh, we can place an order on them to stop. Now, in order to uh, be able to um, to actually ha to be able to apply a public health order, you need something called an order in council, and that is um, that is coming from uh, you know usually the health the minister of health or the lieutenant governor will actually sign off on that at the provincial level, and that is only specific. To the jurisdiction you practice in. So for me, I can only place orders on individuals or companies or businesses that fall within the Fraser Health region. Um, otherwise, that's just giving us way too much power and control um, because it's really important to recognize that, that public health is different from the rest of medicine in that um, we focus on um, the good of of the entire population and not necessarily the individual. And sometimes we need to compromise individuals' human human rights uh, in order to protect the public. And um, you know, that that's a lot of power, you know, to be able to violate someone's human rights. So, you know, we use we use public health orders uh, judiciously um, and we try everything in our means to not have to go down that route, but unfortunately it does sometimes happen. Um, also, for example, in BC, the medical health officer is named in roughly about 40 other uh, acts in the province, uh, so things from like the Milk Act or the School Act, and, um, and we have um, assigned roles with, with respect to those pieces of legislation. Um, Moving on, the MHO at the local level um, can also act as a leader and coordinator for an emergency response, especially if it's public health related. So if it's something like um, a catastrophic outbreak um, or potentially a, a massive um, environmental issue that has health consequences, um, MHOs can be called upon uh, to to lead and work with other leaders in other sectors uh, to manage the emergency. Um, so I won't go into too much detail about this, but usually there's sort of an incident command uh, uh, type structure and, and the MHO would be um, the, the command for, for uh, those types of emergencies. Uh, as many of you are probably aware right now, um, in BC, a public health emergency was declared with respect to the opioid overdose crisis, and uh, many of the MHOs are actually playing uh, a leadership role within their communities, uh, working intersectorally and uh, with community partners and individuals uh, to to try to address and, and stem uh, the number of deaths and overdoses that are occurring. Other typical examples would include, um, uh, you know, the if, if there was a, a mass uh, chemical spill, an MHO may work with the fire chief uh, with respect to um, whether um, we have individual shelter in place or evacuate. Um, and then, of course, in, in recent history, uh, the SARS uh, outbreak that occurred in, in the greater Toronto area, um, that also uh, required a lot of MHO leadership uh, to manage that crisis. Um, with respect to internally within um, our local public health units, just briefly, um, we're usually divided up into different portfolios. And... Um, um, if you're the chief MHO, you would oversee all of 
you know, all of local public health, but you can't handle um, all the minute details on a day-to-day -day basis because you're, you're managing many programs and services. So usually there's a, sort of a reporting up structure. And you'll have um, medical health officers, otherwise known as, um, um, in other jurisdictions, it could be associate medical officers of health or deputy medical health officers, uh, who will tend to um, manage certain portfolio areas. And sometimes this is done in partnership with the operational directors. So as a result, it's really important that you have um, actual solid management, HR, budgeting uh, skills, uh, because you will be required to work with a, um, an operational director and ensuring that um, uh, your programs are running smoothly, um, that you have the reach you need, and you're actually achieving the uh, health outcomes that you want. So, um, you know, it's different from a lot of the other physician training um, in that uh, public health and preventive medicine residency training focuses uh, quite a bit on, on the management uh, and leadership aspects. Um, another role of the MHO is really to liaise with your community um, and sort of act as a community health planner. Um, in some jurisdictions, such as Ontario Public Health, local public health is embedded within the municipal government, uh, which is really helpful because you can then work more upstream um, as you, you get direct access to your um, building planners, your mayor, um, bylaws, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in other places where public health falls into the health authorities or regional um, uh, health, uh, or sorry, health regions, um, you have to work a little bit harder to to get in with your municipalities, um, but um, it's really crucial that you develop effective partnerships uh, uh, with your, your mayors, your councils, and all of the city departments. Um, so I do that a fair bit uh, here in Surrey. Um, we have a great relationship, and we work on a variety of issues. So um, whether it's dealing um, with our homeless crisis, our overdose epidemic, to just the general health uh, of the population. Uh, we work, um, uh, and I should say, not only me, but other members of my team, such as my, uh, we have a community health specialist and our healthy built environment uh, specialist, work directly with city staffers as well. Um, and that's how we can actually be most effective in the local public health is uh, by working with our municipalities on um, developing more upstream programming um, and uh, looking at how our cities are designed and built and, and looking at local policies such as uh, smoking policies and now coming soon, uh, the cannabis uh, policies uh, that would enable, uh, you know, more health promotion in our population. Um, one key project that I'm working on at, with our community right now is um, addressing social isolation. As we know, that's really an emerging factor uh, that's contrib contributing to poor health. Um, and um, the, the municipality, as well as um, other community-based organiz organizations, are really gung-ho on, on addressing that. Um, the MHO um, is also looked upon as a leader and an advocate, and um, this gets a bit tricky sometimes depending on what jurisdiction you practice in. Um, sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's not as easy. Sometimes uh, MHOs um, need to fall in line with uh, their provincial uh, governments or their municipal governments depending on how they're structured. Um, BC and Ontario, Ontario are the only provinces right now that have legislation that protect the independence of a medical health officer. And, and this is really crucial because um, this is a unique situation uh, public health physicians tend to find themselves in because as other physicians, uh, you're expected to speak your truth um, if you feel, you know, this is the best course of action for your patient. 
So for MHOs, our patient is our population. And um, sometimes um, what we feel is best for the health of our population might not um, align with uh, certain provincial policies or strategies. So for instance, there may be some projects that, uh, resource extraction projects that may have uh, potential health implications or looking at uh, taxation policies or, um, um, you know, um, policies around cutting serv uh, social services and programs. Um, so um, it gets a bit tricky and this is where it's really important um, as an MHO to um, really learn the skills of diplomacy, how to be politically astute, and how to negotiate. Um, um, it's really that whole concept of honey attracts more than water. You don't want to be burning bridges. Every relationship is valuable and important, and um, you never know when these things will come in handy. So. Um, it, it, you you de you slowly develop those skills, and I'll admit, you know, I'm about four and a half years out from my training, and I still learn new ways of of working better with other individuals every day. And I think it's it's not something you just finish learning at the end of your residency. I think it's something that continues all throughout uh, your career, um, just through having different experiences. Um, but uh, this, this is uh, one of the issues that we face as medical health officers uh, because sometimes we are considered civil servants. So um, it's a fine balance and it's all about um, working with others, um, not embarrassing your politicians. Um, you know, it, it, it's, not, it's not about winning, it, it's about working together and being collaborative um, to achieve the best uh, for your population. Um, another thing uh, that uh, MHOs have to do a lot of is, is definitely communication. And so um, this is in all forms. Um, we definitely write a lot. Uh, we write a lot of briefing notes, a lot of reports, a lot of emails. And so uh, if you're considering this field, uh, you need to have strong written skills. You need to also have uh, um, good verbal and listening skills as well um, when you're engaging with your various partners. Um, another thing that MHOs are known for is that we tend to do a lot of media and um, we're, you know, in the past it's it was sort of you only heard about public health when something was going wrong so if you were doing our job well you, you would actually be out of the media. Um, I think now in this new day and age of um, social media and really readily access to the internet and technology. Uh, we, we also do a lot of proactive media. So um, we do everything from print media, um, and that includes um, your, your social media, so your, your Twitter, uh, Facebook, um, potentially Instagram, other web communications, blogs as well. Uh, we uh, do, and of course your traditional newspapers, I should say, uh, radio, um, TV, um, so, so, you know, um, I won't go into too much detail about that, but um, you do get a bit of training in your residency program on how to do uh, media interviews, and, it, and it's actually interesting, um, a lot of our Royal College exam questions are, are sort of framed in sometimes in, in a media interview type setting. Uh, but uh, you get better at it the more you do. And um, most, uh, I think actually all uh, local health units and health agents, public health agencies will have access to a strong communications team. And they usually uh, guide you and prep you through these media interviews. Um, Educator and uh, health promotion practitioner. So this kind of uh, liaises with, uh, you know, working with your communities and, and um, you know, building capacity within your communities to enable and empower 
um, every individual to have control over their health and, and uh, you know, create environments that support health. Educator, I think this is really important. As, as you heard, I'm also a clinical assistant professor, and um, I think it's really important. I, you know, I, I love doing these type of sessions. I mentor a lot of uh, residents. Um, I have medical students and residents do rotations with me, and uh, um, I think it's really important as a medical health officer to, to share your knowledge, um, but I also benefit from uh, teaching others because um, I find um, those who are up and coming in their training um, have a lot to teach me as, as well, and uh, just because as things just change so dramatically. so. Um, I really value that. And then, of course, there's that whole educator component uh, with your communities. Um, as a physician, uh, you are often looked upon um, to sometimes uh, educate your, your population or your mayors or councils on a particular health issue um, and provide them with uh, the latest scientific uh, evidence uh, as well as uh, best practice. Um, you know, a lot of this has been going on, um, to just going back to the opioid crisis. Um, um, really um, trying to shift people's mindset, uh, and, and I think we're, slow, we're slowly getting there. Um, you know, a lot of people come in with um, their own values or their own myths, and, and um, you know, uh, trying to be that uh, Incredible uh, resource uh, to your community, and, and getting them to see uh, things differently. Um, so there is a skill in that as well, um, and 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 you you do that fairly often uh, when working with your community partners. Um, and then lastly, um, we we bring a population health perspective, um, and. This is really important because um, when you work with uh, external partners or even other physicians, you know, they tend to view sort of that one one on one care, right? You're the doctor, you have the one patient. Um, when it comes to communities, all they really see is sort of just more health services. You know, we need another hospital, we need more clinics. And, you know, and I'm not denying that, but, you know, our role as um, public health physicians and as MHOs is really to bring forward um, looking at the social determinants of health. And, and we know most of these factors that cause uh, ill health actually are out of the locus of control for the health sector. They, they lie in um, the economic, the justice, the education, the social services, and, and so we always constantly have to keep on on bringing that. And you know, one tip I've sort of learned is, um, and it goes back to the whole communication piece, is I I try to no longer use health language when I'm dealing with uh, other intersectoral partners. Because I already know that the determinants of health are the same as the determinants of crime and the determinants of education. So depending on who I'm engaging with, I tend to um, I tend to speak more of, of, of their language, and um, I think that's how I develop more solid relationship with intersectoral partners. Because then they they feel that buy-in uh, to help address these issues, right? So if we if we look at uh, truancy, uh, for instance, we know education, ed educational attainment, and you know um, having sufficient education is important uh, for good health. Uh, you know, and then the school districts they they want kids to attend school because they know that it will also benefit them later on in life, and likewise. So do the municipalities because if you if you go to school, you'll get a good job and you'll be able to pay taxes. And so the root cause of the truancy, so when we look at that, you know, we look at things like uh, the early childhood experience, whether these children were abused and they're escaping trauma, or, um, you know, issues of poverty, they don't have a um, sort of a stable living situation. Well, we know those determinants also contribute to ill health. So, 
if we can just um, get away from always just focusing on, on health per se and focus on these other issues, um, I think um, it really makes it a lot easier to bring that population health lens when you're working with inter intersectoral partners. So um, I'll just end off on one note in that uh, MHOs do not work alone. They work um, with a brilliant interdisciplinary team um, who have expertise um, of their own. Um, what I love about public health is um, um, I often found met clinical medicine to be very hierarchical. Um, public health is not like that. I view my team members as the same. Everyone has something unique to contribute to. So whether it's our health inspectors, our nurses, our epidemiologists, biostatisticians, evaluation specialists, GIS mappers, visual analytics, our harm reduction coordinators, our community health specialists. Um, I'm, um, I'm sure I'm missing a, a few people here, but our dental assistants, I should say, um, we do a lot of oral health. Um, everyone has their own expertise, and it's in, through working through that interdisciplinary team, um, that's how we're actually going to make a difference in the population. So I'll stop there and take any questions you um, may have. You can just enter those into the chat box. Thanks for that. So this is Emily again. So as uh, we have Judy typing, I have a quick question. You were just talking about uh, the different roles and how you have colleagues that play different roles, have different areas of expertise. Are there some types of colleagues or different or specific um, colleagues with specific expertise that you deal with more closely than others? And is that something that changes or is it fairly constant? Okay. Uh, okay, can you hear me now? Great. Um, that's a great question. So I think it varies um, on your practice as a local uh, MHO, and um, I'm sorry, I'm hearing some static right now. Is that okay? Okay. Um, and basically, it depends on your portfolio. So the way we're structured at Fraser Health, um, we actually have a quite a generalist model plus a specialist focus. So I, I actually work with everyone. So I work with my inspectors, my nurses, my policy analysts. Um, so for me, I have that variety. But if you say, for example, are a local MHO and you just focus on communicable diseases, chances are you may just only work with, say, your epidemiologist, your public health nurses, or your public health inspectors. Um, so it really depends. Um, so I feel fortunate that I actually get to work with um, a large variety of disciplines because it really helps my practice as well. So I'm just going to go to the questions here. So Judy, um, so you're a CCFP uh, for 30 years and you're getting your MPH. Um, kind of too late to get an FRCPC. Is there a role for me to be an M associate? Um, so I can, uh, Judy, I'll give you my email and we can probably touch base a bit more offline. Uh, but I do want to stress um, there are options for re-entry training programs where you don't have to do the full five year. And uh, in your case, if you have your MPH and your CCFP, it'd probably just be an additional two years. Um, it, I think now um, when I look at most of the job postings, they are requiring an FRCPC. Um, potentially in smaller jurisdictions where it is a bit difficult uh, um, uh, finding individuals, they, they may consider uh, an MPH uh, CCFP. But um, I will, uh, I'll put my email at the end of the chat, uh, at the chat box and we, we can talk more um, later on. All right, a question from Laura. Wondering if you would perhaps be able to explain what the role of the community health specialist is. Sure. So generally, um, our community health specialists, um, they come from um, different backgrounds. So um, some are dietitians, some are uh, MPHs with a, a policy background. Um, um, I would say this is, I think, probably a unique role in, in Fraser Health, who we, what we've developed. But I think similar positions exist throughout the country. And uh, basically, their role is um, it's that of, I guess you could say, community development and community capacity building. And it's 
Um, they're really integral to our work um, when we are trying to make our communities healthier. So they're um, what I call my eyes and ears on the ground. They develop those partnerships with our community-based organizations as well as our, our, our municipal departments. And um, uh, they, for instance, at Fraser Health, they support an intersectoral table we have. Um, uh, called our Healthier Communities Partnerships, where we prioritize uh, certain health issues and work on those. Um, they're also instrumental in helping us um, address the opioid epidemic. Um, they also sit on various uh, other tables representing us, so such as our early childhood or early years tables, um, our um, sort of child and youth mental health tables and uh, really provide that population health perspective as well and, and help facilitate partnerships uh, um, with our community. Great. And any other questions? This is Emily again. So as you think of uh, more questions to ask, um, would you be able to give suggestions to someone who's pretty early still in their career and they're, they're thinking of taking this path? How would they get involved and get some of the experience and skills you were mentioning um, at an earlier time? So if they're looking for volunteering ideas or places to intern or specific skills or expertise that they should uh, develop? Sure. So, um, oh, is the static? Okay. I think we're good now. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. Um, so that's a great question. And, um, it's, it's so funny because I feel I can relate public health to almost any topic area. And I think one of my previous mentors, uh, gave me the best advice in order to be a good public health doctor. And she was like, get a life. So that really means actually leading a normal life. And uh, and I should say normal in quote unquote, um, you know, getting out there, having extracurriculars, engaging with people, uh, keeping your eye on the media. So just being really aware uh, of your community. So, you know, um, when you go uh, walking down the street, noticing, um, how long it takes for the walk sign to come on, or do you even have a walk sign, or how safe do you feel crossing the street, or you know when you're when you're shopping for produce, how much access do you have to healthy produce, and what's the cost, you know, and where is it situated in your neighborhood? Did you have to drive there? Um, so I think really taking that lens on really um, helps prepare you for that public health mindset. Um, but uh, in terms of, I'm, I'm definitely a believer in, in getting involved. I think CPHA provides a lot of great opportunities. So if you can get involved with a lot of the policy work, I think that's super helpful. Uh, if you're a public health resident, uh, getting involved with Public Health Physicians of Canada, we have a lot of work uh, that we need assistance with. Um, uh, that will help develop your skills. Um, I think... Uh, really um, taking on some other leadership roles. So um, whether it's joining volunteer boards or um, taking leadership roles in different community-based organizations, I think that's also really helpful. Okay, so we have a question from Patricia. You mentioned changing your language to match the language of your partners and stakeholders. Do you have anything more to add about that? I guess Yes and no. I think, um, you know, I could go into a whole lecture into that, but I, I, I won't. But I think um, the key lessons I've learned uh, through my very short career right now is um, it, it's really employing um, – almost tactics of advertising and marketing. Like, you really need to know who your audience is, right? And and what you want them to do. And once you've established that, you really have to 
speak to their heart and you speak in a way that will get their attention. And I find, unfortunately, in the health sector, we're really good at like showing the data and you know showing all these graphs and, and whatnot. And sure, that speaks to us. We do a lot of preaching to the choir, but it, it's not going to necessarily engage other sectors who we need to. And um, I think really, um, I would love to see greater capacity in public health for more knowledge translation. So um, making the information understandable and more appealing to individuals from their lens. And um, so, you know, and maybe I'm a bit cynical, but for some politicians, you know, talking economics, taking that angle on addressing the social determinants of health and health inequities might make more sense than saying like, hey, these are people's brothers and sisters who are dying, say, for example, from this overdose epidemic, right? If you, you know, you, I would always, of course, start with that because, you know, it's important. But I'd also say, like, these are, you know, um, what we found from our data, for instance, is um, these are men in their, uh, young men in their prime of their lives who are actually not engaging economically. And so that gets politicians' attention because they're like, oh, that's reduced tax revenue. So I, I know it, it might be not as comfortable for us to sort of speak that type of language, but I think um, it actually might make for more effective partnerships. Um, so Paul, Paul's one of my mentors. <laughs> um, would you care to com comment on the work-life balance and how the role balances with non-work activities? Okay, so I think there's a great dialogue going on in this new world where some people are talking more work integration versus work-life balance. Um, so I think there's sort of two teams that are emerging. Um, I'll, I'll speak to the work, I'll, I'll, I'll define what sort of both mean and then uh, as based on what I know, I'm not an expert in this area, um, and, and then sort of what I um, subscribe to. So. Work-life integration, that's sort of a newer term that's coming up where, um, you know, people essentially, they don't work their standard, uh, you know, nine to five and then, you know, go home and forget about work. Um, it, it's more so you're a lot more flexible with your schedule. So um, you may end up doing work one evening, but that works for you, um, you know, because you, you spent your time with your family that afternoon instead of doing work during the afternoon and, and you know, or likewise on your, on your weekend. So, you know, there's sort of that approach. And then work-life um, balance is, um, the way I interpret it is that, you know, you're really, you know, you have a lot more boundaries around when you do work and, um, uh, it, you have more set times for your your life, your personal life, and whatnot. And I think I tend to uh, subscribe to more of the work-life balance piece uh, because I've noted that actually maximizes my productivity. Recognizing, though, that uh, in BC we are currently in a public health emergency, and, and that poses a bit um, challenging when you're in an emergency. It's wartime. Um, so sometimes I do find myself working on evenings and weekends, but I, t I tend to minimize that. I only uh, do it when it's absolutely essential. But um, I do feel either way, if you're doing uh, work integration, uh, work-life integration or work-life balance, um, I think it's absolutely important um, that you do your self-care, you spend time uh, with friends and family, um, because in my case, um, I actually found it made me productive. And that's what a lot of studies are showing, too, that you really just sort of max out at 50 hours a, a week. And um, and uh, depending on what activities you do, um, I will admit, I think public health is a calling for sure. And so I never totally disconnect myself from public health because, you know, when I'm going for walks in nature or I'm traveling around the world, I'm always seeing things from a public health lens. And that's fine because I'm getting inspiration from my work. I'm not sitting there writing uh, 
uh, reports or doing emails. But um, I think it's still important. Um, you know, I, I just find a lot of public health physicians just do this naturally. They carry it with them, and they're always looking with that lens. And uh, But because they're in a, a different type of setting, I think you're more inspired uh, to do better work. Um, great. So we have four more minutes left. I don't know if there's any other final questions. I'm also happy to take questions um, via email as, as well, to the, to the best of my ability. So I'll just type that in here. Well, thanks so much. Um, please don't share that too broadly. That, that would be great. For me, and that it helps you better understand what a public health physician looks like and, and how to get there if that's um, part of your considerations for your career path. So like we mentioned earlier, we've recorded the session and we'll be shorting, uh, sharing that shortly shortly and uh, you'll receive that by email. If you're not a uh, Canadian Public Health Association member or the Public Health Physicians of Canada, consider joining. There are opportunities for, for um, students who want to take on leadership roles with the CPHA at least, but um, definitely get in touch with, the, with both organizations to get involved. There's lots of benefits. I can speak more specifically to the Canadian Public Health Association, but a heads up that our mentorship program will be launching shortly. We'll be putting out a call for mentors this week, and we'll be launching applications for mentees in, in January. So that's one of the perks to being a member. I'll just post that if you want to have uh, a more detailed look. And in the new year, we have another... Um, Another call for our publication, it's um, Health Digest. We also have a student blog. Again, here you need to be a member to, to uh, submit, but definitely consider that um, if that's of interest and you're hoping to hone some of your writing skills, it's a great way to do it. We have an editorial committee that reviews submissions and they work with the writers to get that published. And so that's all for my spiel about the Canadian Public Health Association. Thank you again to Dr. Potty for this insightful presentation. And thanks, everyone, for participating and your, your great questions. We hope you'll be able to join us next month. The topic for that webinar will be a day in the life of a health promoter. So do, do uh, register for that. I've just posted the link. And if you have a few minutes, we have a survey to help us improve these webinar series. So take a few minutes if you're so inclined, and that really helps us. So that's all for us, and we'll see you in the new year. Thanks.